Sherlock Holmes is 100 years old this year. He was introduced to the world by his creator, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, via his publishers, Wardlock, in a story called A Study in Scarlet that appeared in something called Beaton's Christmas Album, which sold out in a couple of weeks. But that was only the beginning. Four novels and 56 short stories followed, and there are now Sherlock Holmes fans all over the world, to whom, of course, he is immortal. And letters addressed to 221B Baker Street still get a reply, telling people that Mr. Holmes thanks you for your letter, but at the moment he's in retirement in Sussex, tending his bees. Well, in honour of the great man, or rather both of them, this evening's guest is going to be Sir Arthur's daughter, Dame Jean Conan Doyle. She's the youngest child of his second marriage, and so she was born in his middle age and was 17 when he died. Dame Jean's career took her into the WAFs before the war. The WAFs became the WRAF after the war, and she rose to being all, all sorts of things. Station commander at Hawkinge, one of the first women to be in charge of an RAF station, and finally to being director of the WRAF, the top job for which she was made a dame in 1963, and from which she retired in 1966. Dame Jean Conan Doyle in just a moment. Dame Jean Conan Doyle is this evening's guest. Good evening, Dame Jean. Good evening. Now, have you been having a busy year already? Have you had invitations to centenary do's of Sherlock Holmes up and down the place? Oh, yes, it's been a very busy year. Unfortunately, I missed the dinner in London because I was ill. Mm. And I, I, mean, I was invited out to America for several events out there, but I couldn't go because I have slight medical problems. But I did go to Switzerland for the unveiling of a, a foundation stone for a new museum, the Sherlock Holmes Museum at Maringham. It's at the bottom of the Reichenbacher Falls. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and that was very, a very eventful day. It was lovely. Mm. Had he he has these fans all over the world. What, what do you suppose the Japanese, for example, make of Sherlock Holmes? Ah, Does the he... Japanese are very keen. Yeah. They've got a splendid Sherlock Holmes society in Tokyo. And I met uh, some of the, well, one of the leading Japanese uh, Sherlockians out in Switzerland. And they had two team, television teams uh, in Switzerland following the Sherlock Holmes Society on their visit. But do they, do they identify with Sherlock Holmes in Japan? It seems quite alien to their I culture, doesn't no, it? No, I'm told they do, that they're very interested in Victorian values, moral values. Oh, I see. And they are interested. Yeah. And uh, I was given one or two very learned papers written by... Uh, in Japanese? Pro- <laughs> in both <laughs> languages. <laughs> but tell me, what, what was your father's view of his creation? Because, I mean, after all, he did try and kill him off at the Reichenbacher Falls, therefore, and presumably, he got a bit fed up with him at that stage. Well, yes. Um, at that stage, he wanted to specialise uh, on, on his um, historical novels, White Company and Sir Nigel and uh, Uncle Bareneck and Brigadier Gerard and all his historical books and he thought they were much more worthwhile than Sherlock Holmes and so and Sherlock Holmes was taking up far too much of his time but uh, he uh, that he probably is supposed to have, had, to have hated Sherlock Holmes and that's quite untrue uh, he had an affection for Holmes mm. and later on uh, when he was writing the stories which uh, formed part of the case book of Sherlock Holmes, I was old enough to uh, appreciate having them read to me, and uh, the whole family were interested in the writing of those stories. And he used to come down lunch and read us uh, the half-written story and yeah. all. And uh, one realized what a great deal of amusement he got out of Holmes. Uh, he loved putting in little touches, showing uh, hum- Holmes's rather human conceit and a slight snobbishness from time to time. And he loved the uh, little bits where he was able to make uh, Holmes pull Watson's leg. Uh, he always had uh, his tongue in his cheek, I think, writing the Holmes stories. He wanted them to be exciting, yeah. of course, but also to be humorous. So, he, he really, Sherlock Holmes, in a sort of a way, was a member of your family, was he? Well, I've often said that he was rather like uh, uh, an uncle who lived in Australia and we never met. But uh, <laughs> rather like that for the children. But so were my father's other characters, Professor Challenger, perhaps even more so, and Brigadier Gerard. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, there are these three characters we grew up with, and uh, of course we knew my father had created. Yes. Yeah. But how, how close was the character of Sherlock Holmes to that of your father? Oh, in personality, not at all. Um, he said that he thought that in the creation of a character, um, there was bound to be the possibilities of, of that character in the author. Mm. And um, in my father's case, of course, my father had a great love of justice, which Holmes had. And he was very um, chivalrous to um, women. Yeah. And and so was Holmes. He didn't though. He didn't play the violin or smoke cocaine. Or like <laughs> no. And I would like to say that Holmes did give up cocaine in 1902. <laughs> <laughs> so that he wasn't a life addict. Mm. Uh, I think that's been very overemphasized mm. uh, recently. Did your father say elementary, my dear Jean? <laughs> no, <laughs> he wouldn't. Have. No, he wasn't brought into our lives in that sort of way. It's a, it's a wonderfully convincing name, though, isn't it? Sherlock Holmes. I mean, we accept yes. it totally now. Do you know where the name came from? Not for certain, but, of course, there are um, various theories. And uh, one is that Holmes was from a cricketer. And, of course, my father was a very keen cricketer. And it could be that he picked it up in that. But, but uh, I think authors... Uh, Mm. Just pick a name out of a hat. Well, what, what about Sherlock? It's such an unusual question. Yes, but, but again, I think there was a Sherlock, but uh, I don't know. Mm. I couldn't say one way or the other. People have theories about it, but yeah. But, but no also, one knows. the extraordinary business is about these clothes that he used to wear, which again we now take totally for granted, but a deerstalker hat and sort of a tweedy cape in the yes. West End of London. In yeah. Victorian days, oh, it can't but, have been ordinary. But my it? father never had Holmes wearing a deerstalker hat. <laughs> that was the illustrator. Really? Sidney <laughs> Paget, who was an extremely good illustrator. But my father never mentioned uh, deerstalker. Oh, I see. Yes, your father wasn't too keen now either on the, uh, the sort of looks that Sherlock Holmes had in the illustrations, was he? He thought he was a more rugged man. Yes, he did. Uh, he always thought that the illustrations portrayed... Uh, too handsome a man. But then uh, uh, Sidney Paget used his brother, his rather handsome brother, as a model for the illustrations. Oh, I see. But as you were saying, you know, we tend to forget that uh, nowadays that, that uh, your father wrote an enormous amount of, of material, quite apart from Sherlock Holmes, as you've been saying, historical novels like Micah Clarke and <laughs> all the rest, of, and, and as you said, Professor Chaloner, The Last World. He had a tremendous outpouring, didn't he? Yes, oh, he, yeah, he most certainly did. But he could have written very, very much more than he did. But I, I think that once he had become famous, I think he felt a great responsibility towards putting something back into this world. And uh, that he uh, took up cases where he thought the, the weak were suffering and they needed a champion. And uh, he also uh, felt very strongly about the defense of this country. And, uh, for instance, I think many people may think that he earned his knighthood through the creation of Sherlock Holmes. Well, that is not true. Uh, we've always understood, uh, he understood, that he got it because he wrote um, a pamphlet explaining Britain's position in the South African War. Because when he came back from the Boer War, where he'd been a doctor in a military hospital for some, well, not for a very long time, but for some time, a very crucial time, when he came back, he was horrified to find that on the continent of Europe, all the propaganda was pro-Boer. Mm. And nobody had put our case, and we were being accused of brutality, our soldiers of behaving in a brutal manner which my father knew was not true. Mm. So he organized and uh, put out an appeal for public subscription and wrote a pamphlet which was translated into all the different languages on the continent and were distributed to key people or sold yes. uh, for a few pennies. Yes, the thing was, he was already a great celebrity in his day, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he was, and he used it to, to help other people. 
And not only in this country either, I mean, America as well. He was, he was, both his books and The Man were, were highly regarded. Everybody. Oh, they loved him, yes. They? Oh, indeed. <laughs> yeah, yes, he was. Yeah. But yes, now, you, physically, I think he was quite a big man, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Um, he wasn't as big as he sometimes described as, because uh, he was only six foot one and a half, but he was very broad, very thick set, mm. six foot one and a half. Uh, and, of course, he was a great sportsman. He was a very manly man. And uh, the few sports that, that he didn't compete in at a very high, high uh, comparatively high level. Yes, cricket was a big thing, though, wasn't yes, it? Cricket, yes, the cricket, he was minor ca- county standard. Uh, but he played um, goalkeeper and back for Portsmouth. Did he? At soccer, yes. Mm. It was an amateur uh, side at the time, but apparently it was the runner-up in the county cup, and it wasn't a bad side. Mm. And he played Rugby at university. And but cricket, did he play for the MCC, I know. He got yes, a hundred, I think, on his first time out at Lords. He, he did do that, and he um, got a hat trick at Lords once. He, he bowled at W.G. Grace, which I think gave him much greater pleasure than having created Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> And uh, he also, um, I think, in the match against Cambridge, uh, he took seven wickets for 51. Did he, Richard? Yes. Oh, very good. And in his, um, the best sort of minor first-class cricket, he averaged 32 yeah. batting. So he and was he, a good all-rounder. And he was a boxer? And he, oh, yes, he, he loved boxing. And a skier? Yes, he introduced cross-country skiing into Switzerland. Yeah. And uh, but he, boxing was a great love of his. He thought it was as good as any sport there was. Because mm. he made you box, didn't he? He didn't make me. I had to make him allow me to. <laughs> he was very against it. <laughs> but he but, did give in. <laughs> did the writing talent come down to the next generation? Have you ever tried to write yourself? Oh, yes, I tried when I was a small girl. I tried and I tried. But I wasn't any good at it. Mm. And uh, since then, I've been far, far too busy to try. Uh, and, uh, and if I did try, I knew I, I know I couldn't. <laughs> but you, curiously, I noticed from, from an entry in Who's Who that you, you still hold the copyright on your father's works in America. Yes, I do. Yes. So they have different rules over there. They do. Today. The copyright uh, laws are quite different from the copyright laws in this country. Very mm. complicated. <laughs> but there we are. In that case, we won't go into it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> shall, we, shall we pause and have a bit of music and we'll be back in just a moment? Which was the seduction theme played by the radio orchestra with John Pearson conducting and playing the piano. Dame Jean Conan Doyle is this evening's guest, daughter of Sir Arthur, of course, whose most famous creation, Sherlock Holmes, is 100 years old this year. Consequently, I imagine there are all sorts of I don't know, pastiches, I suppose, coming out as well, are there? Yes, there are. Uh, I may say I'm never very happy about this, because I always think that a character belongs to the author who created that character and shouldn't be played around with later on. And writers come along and make that character do things that the original author would never have contemplated the character doing. I think it's all wrong. I think a writer should create his own characters. Presumably they don't ask your permission before they do so. Um, well, they have to in America. And um, I, I do allow a certain number of pastiches in America if they are in period, in character, and are well, really well written. I would rather not allow any. But why I do is that I hope by doing that, I can influence the standard of pastiche which is written in this country. Mm. Because no, most people hope that their books will be published in America eventually. True. <laughs> and unless they're a good standard, they won't be. But of all the, of all the portrayals of, of uh, Sherlock Holmes, all the film portrayals and the stage yes. portrayals and so on, which one do you think has been the nearest to your father's idea of the character? Uh, do you mean on film or yes, the sort of television Basil Rathbones and or all those. what? Well, there have been dozens uh, well, of Well, I either. think Basil Rathbone has probably been nearest to, to Holmes. Uh, Arthur Wilton was extremely good. Uh, I, I think that Jeremy Brett, Brett is very good, uh, up to point, but I think that perhaps he, he's a little bit 
too highly strung in the part at times. Holmes wasn't highly strung like mm. that. Or he may have had his moments when he was bored, but <laughs> not. Um, but and also Holmes was extremely courteous. He wouldn't have been rude to people. Whereas I think the Brett character does come across as rather unpleasant Holmes. Mm. Sharp. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. A bit. Uh, he was conceited, but not all that conceited. <laughs> and uh, but but I think he's very good, and I think the stories themselves, of course, and the production and everything is quite the best. Good. Oh, I think the production is absolutely excellent. Let's come back to the man himself and and uh, your childhood days when when uh, you were growing up. Was he a, was he a good father? Did he tell you wonderful bedtime stories? Uh, he was extremely good father. We were all very close to our parents. And, of course, he was writing at home, and I saw a lot of him. And he was one, one, no, my mother was a very loving personality. Uh, my father was one who was always brought in as the ultimate comforter. <laughs> uh, he was very kind, and he didn't tell us stories, no. Uh, he used to organize games for us, adventurous games, cross-country mm -hmm. games, and that sort of thing, with very bloodthirsty clues. Uh, but, um, and he, what, what, do you mean? What, what sort of game? Uh, well, uh, if it was uh, a game which we were chasing a pirate or something, he would, they would leave a rag soaked in uh, red ink blood, <laughs> things <laughs> like that, and, and uh, little horrible little rhymes <laughs> reminding us what the, the evil, dangerous people we were chasing and, and so on. My mother used to get a little nervous about oh, the whole lovely. thing. They didn't do us any harm. You were the youngest, of course, and you were also yes, a, a girl. Yes. Were, did that give you special privileges, or were you, by contrast, bullied? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had one brother who was <laughs> inclined to resent the fact that the girl was tagging along. But uh, on, on the whole, it was all right, because my father saw fair play. He did? Uh, yes, he never allowed me to be yeah. bullied. Can I ask about one aspect of your father's life, which I think has intrigued many people, certainly me, which is his spiritualism, which he came to yes. uh, espouse very much towards the end of his, his life. Now, what started that off? Well, he became interested in, in psychic things in the early 1890s. And he was always active in psychic research. It wasn't something that he leapt into. It was something that he had been studying for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the time came that he was convinced, he was a crusader at heart, a man with enormous moral courage. And he knew that it was, he would be ridiculed over his belief in spiritualism. But he was determined that having found this great comfort for himself and uh, uh, his wife, my mother, because they had lost so many relatives in the First World War, that he would share it with others. And so he started um, uh, a mission, a tour, really, lecturing in various countries, in Australia, Canada, America, South Africa, and we went along too. My brothers and I were, all went with them. And, but it uh, did mean, of course, that he wasn't writing in these years. Yeah. So for many years, he wasn't following his profession at all. But do you, do you remember seances being held at home? Oh, yes. And did he ever contact those relatives that, yes, that he yes, lost in the yes, war? Yes, he did. Yes. Yes. All except one. I don't know which one it was, but he wrote in one of his books in Pender. Mm one relative. What, what did he actually believe? Did he believe in a, in a physical presence after death? Was that his... He believed in an afterlife and that it was possible uh, not, uh, under certain circumstances for that soul to communicate with people on this earth. But uh, I may say that he always warned me and my brothers and everyone always to be on lookout for fraudulent mediumship. And uh, um, I'm a very sceptical person. I, I believe there is an afterlife and I believe it is possible, rare, very rare, but that it is possible for communication. You see, he, he he did go into some strange, rather dubious areas. I mean, there was, there was that famous case of the photograph of the fairies. Which, yes, well, which there, um, I think more of has been made 
<laughs> and, uh, I don't think he, he has been shown in a very fair light because at the time, of course, he, he was very busy on other things. He was going off to Australia to lecture and he left a lot of the research to other people. He didn't go up himself and research things. Uh, he did uh, see that the photographs were sent to Kodak Company to find out if they could find out whether those photographs were a fraud. And they wrote back and said that, that they couldn't. Mm. Uh, so naturally, he took the uh, view of specialists as being very, um, very much in favor of the photographs being genuine. He wrote the book of The Coming of the Fairies, but in it he said that uh, if... Um, the, the, my judgment on this is not final. I'm afraid I haven't got the exact wording, but it amounts to this. My judgment on this is not final, but I think there is a strong case Yes. for the existence of fairies. Yes, because the photograph now is, well... Oh, yes, the they were fake. fraud. Yes, yes mm. absolutely. But my father was a, uh, a very honourable man, and uh, I think he found it very difficult to believe that two girls should lie yes. like that. And mm. the girls did say that though the, um, the women, I should say, <laughs> said that um, the photographs were fakes, but they had seen fairies. Mm. Mm. Well, I can't understand why they should lie about... about no, it's all, a very, it's all a strange story anyway. <laughs> it yes. is. It's very strange. And there are people who say they've seen fairies. I, I don't know about you folks. <laughs> I wouldn't express an opinion <laughs> because I've never researched. <laughs> and there speaks somebody with connections, <laughs> strong connections with the RAF, indeed the WRAF. Really, which comes on to a, a sort of final point. Your father was very interested in all the things the services did, as you were saying earlier on. Would he have approved of women in the services, do you think? Oh, yes, I'm sure he would. But I'm sure that because he, he did have a great respect for women's intellect. And uh, though he was against the suffragettes at one time because he thought their methods were wrong, and he foresaw a lot of trouble between husband and wife and so on, he had a great respect for women. Mm. He yeah. would really like to have fought, wouldn't he, in, in oh, yes, the Boer very War much and so. the First World War? Very much so. And uh, after all, you, you ask about um, whether he would have approved of women in the services. Well, uh, the moment I was old enough, I was whisked up to join the Brownies. <laughs> <laughs> and the village pack and my father was all for that and all for things and so I think he would have thought that service to one's country was a very honourable profession well he obviously a very remarkable man indeed and, uh, and his famous creation Sherlock Holmes it seems to me is as alive today as he ever was isn't he he still gets his fan mail and he still has tremendous he, hordes of fans all over the world he still takes up a lot of lot of time. <laughs> I understand my father getting tired of him at one stage because certainly this year Sherlock Holmes is not letting me have much time for anything else than the non-string correspondence. Well I'm very glad talking he, about him. he gave you time to come and see us this evening Jane. Oh it's delightful to come and meet you. Bye bye. Thank you very much indeed.